All right, so let's uh, do the skeletal system. Um, the way I broke up the skeletal system is there's the lab section and then there's the electric se uh, section. The lab section, which we'll do later on during the course, is the actual names of the bones. The humerus and its seven parts, the femur and its 20 parts, it's the skull and its 50 parts, or whatever, something to look forward to. But the lecture portion is about classifying the muscle, or the classifying the bones, how bones form in the fetus, how after, let's say, a fracture occurs, how does it fuse together? We'll talk about articulations. It's more of the theory, the physiology, although we'll be talking a little bit about anatomy. And some of it, as I mentioned before, is the, the lecture is also going to pertain a little bit of histology of bone also. So there's going to be an overlap of what I talked about last time in uh, histology. Okay? So uh, let's get started with the skeletal system. This is how you're all feeling after that wonderful exam. I realize that. Okay? Okay. So the skeletal system. We have vanishing bones. Sometime in your life, you're going to lose 600 bones. Before you were born, you had over 800 bones, separate bones. But many fused, and you were born with about 450 bones. And then you're going to have more fusion going on of these bones throughout your childhood and adolescence life. And when you reach about age 20, you have the full set of adults a full set of adult bones and a skeleton of 206 bones, okay? But you lose a lot, okay? So we call it vanishing bones. Where this all comes about, we're gonna get into, okay? Now, skeletal system deals with bones, right? It consists with bones, but it also is going to deal with cartilage, tendons, and ligaments. And remember what I said, ligaments connect bones to bones Tendons connect, connect muscles to bones. Like ten, think of muscles being very tense, right? Tendons, right? Okay. Functions of the skeletal system. It's going to support soft organs, fight against gravity, and keeps us up straight. It's going to protect soft organs. You've got a skull to protect the brain. You've got a rib cage to protect the heart and lungs. You've got a vertebral column to protect a very vital spinal cord. So it's going to protect soft organs here. It's also going to provide movement. Muscles will be attached here, and you can actually move from one place to another. It'll store calcium and other salts. Not just calcium. Sure, calcium is the big one, along with phosphate. You need a lot of phosphate when we have to deal with ATP, right? But sodium's in there, and potassium, magnesium, and a bunch of other inorganic stuff. It's going to store fat in what we call the yellow bone marrow. The red and the yellow bone marrow, we'll talk about that later. We're also going to have hematopoiesis, as I mentioned before. Blood cell formation. That'll be located in the red bone marrow. Okay? So, let's see how we're going to classify bones. We could have long bones. They're going to be longer than wider. These are mainly bones of your four limbs, including your fingers, including your toes. The only thing it doesn't include is your wrist bones, your ankle bones, your knee bones. Okay? Short bones. They're going to be, as I said, little stubby things, cubes. These will be located in your wrists and your ankles. They're known as the carpals and the tarsals. I think after the first exam, this should start ringing bells. And you can see why you need to know that chapter one stuff, because it's going to make your life easier later on. We also have flat bones. The flat bones, like your shoulder. The shoulder blade is flat. Believe it or not, your bones in your skull are flat. They're curved, but they're flat when you look at it. The sternum, which is your chest plate, is flat too. The ribs, you would think that they're, well, they're round. Well, not necessarily. 
there's a rib, and if we take a cross section of it, it's not like this, it's more like this, flattened. And when you get into the bones in lab, you'll feel them and see that they are flattened. There, then there's bones that are just, they don't fit any category. We call them irregular bones. It's kind of sad to be an irregular bone. <laughs> okay. Now, your vertebrae, all the bones in your backbone, they don't fit any category like that. And you'll learn about those. There are two bones in the skull that are not flat. One looks like a bat. It's called a sphenoid bone. That doesn't fit in any category, as well as another one that kind of looks more cube-like than anything, but it's got other points to it. That's called the ethmoid bone. And you'll see those later on. So these are the different types. Here's the long bones over here, short bones. These are flat bones, and these just don't have a place for them. It's just sad to be an irregular bone. Okay. All right. Let's look at features of a long bone, though. It's much easier to talk about uh, the features of a long bone as opposed to these other bones. Um, but it's not bad. What I'm going to do first is define the, um, define the parts of the long bone. And then I'll, uh, well, I'll, as I do that, I'll be drawing pictures. Um, and then I'll show you the actual diagrams on the next few slides. The diaphysis. That's the actual shaft of the bone. So we're going to take a bone like this. Um, actually, you know, people are like, oh, I just started drilling. No, you, you just keep it there, all right? I'm going to just make it a little bit shorter. I'm gonna, but I'm going to do some other stuff with this. So the diaphysis is going to be this area right here, the shaft of the bone, okay? We also have the epiphysis, that's going to be the ends of the bone. And because you took the first exam, you know that long bones must have a proximal epiphysis and a distal epiphysis. You have to put it all together, right? At the ends of these bones, there's going to be what we call articular cartilage. That's going to be made up of hyaline cartilage. If we have another bone over here, that it's going to articulate with, this bone will also have articular cartilage. Cartilage does not have any nerves in it. Cartilage doesn't have any blood vessels in it. Bone has both. So if this is, let's say, your femur and your tibia, your thigh bone and your shin bone, the weight on here you're not going to feel so much pressure because it's riding right on top of the cartilage. So the cartilage doesn't have nerve, nerves, it's not going to hurt all that pressure. But as you use your knees over the decades, this cartilage is going to start grinding down on itself. And what's going to happen here is that you're going to have exposed bone there. Now you're going to have bone to bone on certain areas. You'll be feeling the pain for that. This is called osteoarthritis. Okay? And what will happen is, you'll see that as this grinds on each other, it'll start wearing down on the bone, and then the bone tries to adapt and make more bone, but it has no place to go because 
you got to let it sit there for six to eight weeks. We're going to get into that for fractures. So it has no place to go, so the bone starts growing in weird places. These are called osteophytes, and you'll see that in a few slides later on. These are called osteophytes, or better known to laymen as spurs. Now it's not smooth anymore, so you're not going to be able to, it's more rocky, you're not going to be able to bend your joint as much as what you had before. Your range of motion has been limited. And if you know people who have osteoarthritis, that's what they're complaining of, the pain and that they can't bend their hands as much as we did before. So the articular cartilage is a protective thing to allow us to run and jog and do all the normal activities that we can. Be kind to your knees, please, okay? You can't grow back your cartilage. There's no really blood vessels there. Once it's gone, it's gone. Now back to the diaphysis. In the center here, there's going to be a medullary cavity, as I explained to you in histology. In children, it's red bone marrow, and that's where all the blood cells are being made. In adults, it's yellow bone marrow, and that's where fat is being stored, amongst other places. We do have red bone marrow in adults, but not in the long bones. They're in the skull and vertebrae. Now, we have something called an epiphyseal plate. The epiphyseal plate is located in between the diaphysis and the epiphysis, in this area right here. right here. This is the part where we're going to have the long bone grow lengthwise. There's hyaline cartilage in these epiphyseal plates. And we have something called the transition zone. If I draw it like this, The epiphyseal plate is here. There's hyaline cartilage here. It goes through mitosis. This cell over here will, will go through mitosis and make two cells. Going up, and well, one will stay there. Does that make sense? This one, and then this one will have one that goes this way and one to move up. This one, you see how it's growing lengthwise? Over the years. This is what we call the epiphyseal plate. At about 20, 21 years old, the hyaline cartilage doesn't do that anymore. It stops going through mitosis. We say that the epiphyseal plate fuses. And when it fuses, you don't have growth anymore. This mitosis happens much faster during puberty. And thus you get the name or the term, the growth rate increases, right? The growth spurt. You're always growing. You're like here, it's like, Eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and then it goes like that, right? You see what I mean? It just goes faster. When it fuses, we learn, we uh, now call it something called the epiphyseal line. When we get into fractures, you can start seeing things having problems. If you have a fracture of your bone and it goes into, and the fracture goes into the epiphyseal plate and you're only five years old, do you see what's going to happen here? How one bone is going to grow faster than the other one? Those are murderous to actually fix. When I say murderous, it is very painful. And I'll explain that towards the end of the, the uh, skeletal system. They have to crank on this thing and stretch it every day. 
the metaphysis is where the epiphyseal plate is located. So you have a diaphysis, epiphysis, and the metaphysis is actually here. It contains the epiphyseal plate. The periosteum, it's that tough fibrous connective tissue that's going around on the outside, keeping the bone together. And I showed you that with that model. I also mentioned to you that if you go to KFC, you get your bone after you eat all the meat, and you start picking at the bone and starting to let it fray a little bit off the side of the bone. That's periosteum. Ooh. Okay? Periosteum covers everywhere on the bone except where the articular cartilage is. The periosteum will also have little holes in it. A hole is referred to as a foramina. You'll see that word popping up quite often when we get into bone, bones and lab. It's called a nutrient foramina. It's going to allow the blood vessels coming from the outside going in to the bone itself. The endosteum is going to line the medullary cavity. And that will contain osteoclasts chewing away at the bone and putting it into the calcium, into the bloodstream. Okay, so. Proximal epiphysis, distal epiphysis. There's your diaphysis. You see the medullary cavity. In this case, yellow bone marrow. You also see periosteum around here, but let's take this big chunk here and zoom it up. Sorry, man. Okay? Here's the periosteum. You can also see the nutrient foramen where the blood vessels are going to go through those holes. There's the yellow bone marrow, and as I showed you in histology, you can also see some of the compact bone. The endosteum, which is not, oh, it is labeled there. It's the lining of the medullary cavity where the yellow bone marrow is in this picture. Bone marrow. Red bone marrow is in children and adults. Obviously, adults have it too. You're still making red blood cells. This is where the site of hematopoiesis, where blood formation takes place. In adults, we have yellow bone marrow, though. And that's going to store triglycerides and energy, right? It's all your fat. Now, hematopoiesis, where does it take place? In the embryo and fetus, it takes place in the liver and in the spleen. And even before that, like the first two weeks of gestation, or after fertilization, it actually occurs in the yolk sac. But we lose the yolk sac pretty, uh, pretty early in the, embryo, in, in the embryo. But then we go into the liver and spleen that makes the red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets. In children, the red bone marrow is mainly in the, well, it's in the long bones, mainly in the legs. Typically the femur and the tibia. Femur is the thigh bone, and tibia is the uh, shin bone. In adults, the red bone marrow, its primary source is going to be the trunk and the head. So the chest plate, the ribs, the skull, the vertebrae. That's where the main place is. But, let's say you're losing a lot of blood. Maybe, God forbid, you have cancer. And your body is, as soon as it's making a red blood cell, it's going away because the cancer is just taking it all away. Or you have leukemia, and it's, it's not making enough white blood cells that are functioning. So then, the bone marrow in an adult, let's say a 40-year-old, the bone marrow says, look, we need to make more red blood cells. We need to make more blood cells. So it goes up to the brain and says, hey, brain, you know... We're in the skull right now, and you're our buddy right inside of here, but your body has these conversations. Okay? <laughs> and it says, look, we used to make blood over in the legs when we were a child. 
the factories are still there. Is it possible that we can actually turn them back on because we need to make more red blood cells? The brain says that's a wonderful idea. They have this conversation. And what happens here is that the bones in, or the, uh, the, blo the, um, the marrow in the legs starts kicking on in an adult. It's more act active during that time. And when it does, because it's more active, these people tend to get leg pain. Because it's not usually something that the legs are doing in adulthood. Okay? If they need more red blood cells than what the legs are doing, then it says, well, we really did it when we were an embryo in our mother's womb. God rest her soul. But we used to make it in the liver and spleen. Factories are still there. And then that would kick on over there. Okay? Now, I don't want people to think, but I have leg pain. Does that mean? No, that doesn't. You've got to put everything together. That doesn't mean you have cancer. I'm just saying, if one has cancer, it would make sense why, their leg, why they would have leg pain. Okay? God, I don't want everyone to have a basket cake. Become a, <laughs> get a complex here. Okay? But does that make sense about primary, secondary, tertiary sources? Okay? And in the adult, all the red area skeleton is where the primary source is, okay? All right, now bone structure and bone histology. For the most part, this is going to be reviewed for you for histology. This is where it's kind of bridging together for that, first, that second exam for you. The bone structure has many, is MUO is made up of many tissues. It's not just hard stuff, all right? There's cartilage or connective tissue in there, there's cartilage in there, there's vascular tissue, lymphatics, adipose tissue, nervous tissue, there's other things in there than that hard bony stuff. It's mostly bony hard stuff, but there is other stuff in there. Now, when we look at this, we got two forms of bone in your bone. There's compact bone, which is going to be a solid thing, and those are where those tree stumps were if you look at it under a microscope. But then you've got the spongy bone that's over here also. The spongy bone is that loop I was telling you about that you ladies have in that in the bathtub. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. So we have, you can also call it cancerous bone, a trabecular bone, it's all the same stuff. Okay? All those interwoven stuff, those little spongy areas, those lines going through there have a special name. We call it trabeculae. Okay? The spongy bone is going to be surrounding, it'll be underneath or deep to the, to the endosteum, right? It, it's going to have the uh, medullary cavity, which has the bone marrow, and then the lining of that is going to be endosteum, and then I guess outside of that is going to be spongy bone and then compact bone, okay? So you'll see spongy bone kind of underlying the endosteum here. But it's going to all be in the ends of the bones also, the epiphyses. You're not going to find any compact bone in the epiphyses. And we'll explain that later on when we talk about ossification. So if you take a cross section of the bone itself, and I kind of drew that for you yesterday, there's the bone marrow which is in the medullary cavity. The lining of the medullary cavity is going to be the endosteum. Then you've got spongy bone here, compact bone, and then this thin layer out here is the periosteum. Okay? Questions on that? Okay. So you saw this before. This is what it looks like hist histologically. We'll show that a little bit better later on. But they look like tree stumps, cut tree stumps. And those concentric rings that you see, the bullseye, so to say, is what we call lamellae. On a, yeah, uh, the other thing I forgot to mention, but the center bullseye over here is called the Haversian Canal, okay, where we have Haversian blood vessels. There's a couple other names they could call it too. Osteonic Canals and Central Canal, all right? A lot of different names for the same thing, running theme in A&P, okay? Here's what spongy bone looks like histologically, which you won't have to worry about in histology. But here you have the bone trabeculae, and then in between here you're going to find fat tissue, adipose tissue. Okay. 
Now, specialized cells of the bone, which we mentioned before. Not the first one, though. Something called osteoprogenitor cells. These are basically the stem cells. These osteoprogenitor cells are going to make all of these cells here. It's our stem cell. And 2% of bone consists of these living cells. So your bone is not just hard, it's living too, okay? So the osteoprogenitor cells will make the osteoblasts, and then indirectly the osteoblasts will become osteocytes once they go into a lacuna. So directly it makes an osteoblast, indirectly it makes an osteocyte. Does that make sense? If you don't have the osteoblast, you can't have the osteocyte. They also will make the osteoclast, the little Pac-Man that we talked about. Even before the osteoprogenitor cell was ever developed, it came from another thing called mesenchyme. Mesenchyme is a very high and a very undifferentiated cell, stem cell, that makes all the connective tissue. It makes the blood cells, it makes the, uh, the cartilage cells, it makes the fibroblast for the connective tissue proper, it makes the osteoprogenitor cells also. So these are the bone stem cells, undifferentiated cells that will turn into osteoclasts or osteoblasts. And then indirectly, the osteoblast becomes the osteocyte. Okay? Osteoblasts. As I mentioned to you before, if I wanted to paint this floor over here, I'm going to get someone who could just put down the bulk of paint on the floor. All right? Doesn't mess. It'll be messy. It's just going to take the paint and it's going to put it all over the floor. And they're going to paint the whole floor, no big thing, paint it all over, and then they can't paint themselves or paint anymore because they paint themselves in a little corner and I can't go anywhere. Now they have this little hole they live in called a lacuna, and now they're known as an osteocyte. Meanwhile, that paint or calcium needs to go into the bloodstream at certain times for muscle con uh, contraction, for nerve stimulation, for whichever. So the osteoclasts are going to come in here, osteoclasts are going to chomp away and put the calcium back into the blood. But the osteoblast is going to lay down the bulk of the bone. This is called osteoid. Okay? Osteoid is bone matrix without the organic substance that gets laid down later. The organic substance we're talking about is collagen that's in there. The inorganic minerals, magnesium, calcium, and stuff, is added much later. There's something called hydroxyapatite. Hydroxyapatite is actually the hard stuff, the cement of the bone. Hydroxyapatite is made up of calcium and phosphate crystals. And that's the bulk of the bone itself. Osteocytes, as I said before, they were once osteoblasts that painted themselves on a little corner and now they have no place to go. Now they're going to be able to get all the nutrients from the Habergian canals that contain the Habergian blood vessels and pass those nutrients from one osteocyte to another in the lacuna by way of those little rivers called canaliculi. And it will pass those nutrients throughout the rest of the bone. So the osteoblasts are our builders. Okay, they're going to put calcium into the bone. 
Then we have osteoclasts, like little Pac-Men. They're giant multinucleated cells that are, have a lot of lysosomes in it. Lysosomes are going to digest things. So it's going to digest the bone to put it into the bloodstream, at least the calcium into the bloodstream. When it does that, we say that it resorbs bone. Little fancy word, okay? And it shapes the bone. We're going to see also if this is going to be your bone over here. And you break the bone, osteoclasts, I'm sorry, osteoblasts are going to fill this all in with calcium, like glue. And if we leave it like that, the bone is not going to look right. It'll have a bump over here and have a bump over here. So osteoclasts class are going to shape the bone. Little Pac-Man. It's going to chew away at this and put it into the bloodstream so that this little bump here is not so noticeable. But you don't break bones all the time. So osteoclasts do other things more important just to put the calcium into the bloodstream so we can use it for other things. As I said, nerve conduction, muscle contraction. So it's going to release the calcium into the bloodstream. So if we increase osteoclast activity, calcium will go up in the blood. If we decrease osteoclast activity, we're going to decrease the calcium in the blood. Okay? Pretty straightforward. If the osteoclast activity is too excessive, your bones become brittle. Does that make sense? Estrogen, when someone has a lot of estrogen, just during your childbearing age in a woman, the estrogen keeps the osteoclast tone down. Don't get too active. It's like a parental thing. Alright? We like you over there. You're doing your job. Just don't get too active. When they go through menopause at 50, 51 years old, the, the estrogen goes down and the osteoclast activity becomes excessive. What's that disease that they're more prone to getting? Osteoporosis. And that can lead to fractures. Okay. So osteoclasts are the sculpturers. Osteoblasts put the clay on here. Just put piles of clay on here. Bulk it up. Osteoclasts is going to chisel away and turn it into a Michelangelo. Okay? If you think of it that way. So when you compare it throughout your entire life, now look at the legend over here, because I don't want you to get mixed up. OB is osteoblast, OC is osteoclast, not osteocyte, okay? In a child, you're gonna have more osteoblast activity than you do osteoclast activity. You're building bone. As an adult, it should be about equal. When we get older, even us guys, when we're like seven years old or so, the osteoblast activity is a lot less than the osteoclast, and the osteoclasts become excessive, and that's why we see osteoporosis at much later in life. So this is what your bone is made out of, and I'm not going to ask you about the percentages. I want you to see the, the concept here, that a third of your bone is organic, mostly collagen. So you have this organic stuff in it. It's not just cement. The biggest part, though, is here, which is calcium, and also here, which is phosphate. When you put calcium and phosphate together, it's called hydroxyapatite, which makes up more than 50% of bone. There's other stuff in there like magnesium and sodium and carbonate and so forth. But these are the big ones. 
Okay? So why do we have collagen in there? Well, this is the way bone is. You have collagen, which is organic stuff. You have hard stuff, which is going to be hydroxyapatite. Calcium, minerals, and then you've got the collagen in there. If we remove the mineral, remove the calcium, then what's left in there is collagen. Right? Collagen is going to be able to bend. And you can do... Am I doing a sales pitch here saying so much? All right. Oh, I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking about, right? If you take your bone from KFC or wherever and you put it in vinegar, acetic acid, the acetic acid will actually combine with the, or react with the calcium and pull the calcium out of the bone. You leave it in there in a bowl of, of acetic acid, vinegar, just regular vinegar for about two to three days. Take the bone out. Keep it submerged. Make sure, because sometimes it floats. So put a spoon on or whatever. Keep it submerged. And then take it out about two or three days. You'll be able to do this. Bend it all the way around. You'll see a lot of foam on top. It the, the acetic acid precipitates with the, uh, with the calcium. So that's what that foam is on there. But it's safe to do even for kids. Okay? So that's what happens. You can also do that with an egg. Right? There's calcium on the hard shell. You put that egg in vinegar, acetic acid, keep it, because it'll float, so keep it submerged in the vinegar for about two to three days, take it out, and you know when you crack open an egg, the shell breaks, of course, but then you've got that film that happens underneath, it's called chorion, okay? That'll stay intact, but all that calcium came off, and you've got what we call a rubber egg. It's not really rubber, it's that chorion that's underneath, and that's what happens there. So that's what happens if we remove the collagen. Uh, yeah, we remove, no, I'm sorry, if we remove the calcium. If we remove the collagen, then your bones are like glass. It shatters. So you need the two. It's going to give it sturdiness, but it's going to give a little bit. It's basically, if you take a glass bowl over here and drop it on the floor, it's going to shatter. But you take a plastic bowl over here and make it fall, it won't. You see? And it gives it some flexibility, but yet it's still firm. So does that make sense? Does that tell you the significance why we have the two in there? All right, let's talk about diseases then. Because what it, is there a disease where the minerals is removed? Is there a disease where the collagen is removed? Yes. Rickets. Who here has heard of rickets? Okay, we don't see it as much because we're in third world countries, yes, but first world countries, no, because we have a good balanced diet and you know uh, in the schools and stuff. But it's soft bones due to calcium salts that are decreased in the body, so they either have a lack of calcium in, a di in their diet or vitamin D, which is needed for calcium absorption in your diet. It's, com it's a common disease in a third world country in children. In adults, it does, but what adults don't have rickets. They call it something else. They call it a neater word. It's called osteomalacia, which means bone softening. Okay? And that's for people who have, like, you know, adults who have a decrease in calcium in their diet. So what happens with them in toddlers and older children, the, how the weight is distributed, it's either they're... Their, their legs start bending, like you saw with the bone, with the, the chicken bone, right? So what happens is the bones in their legs, they'll either become knock knees or they're going to be bowed leg. Because of all that weight, it starts bending the bones because it can't hold it up straight. They'll get bone pain, dental problems too, because your teeth, or sorry, your jaw is holding your teeth, but they soften, the jaws soften, so the teeth start coming out. The holes get bigger because they just mold to that and get soft. So muscle weakness, hypocalcemia. Hypocalcemia is a decrease of calcium in the blood for that obvious reason, okay, no minimum. Muscle weakness, 
Because like I said, calcium is needed for muscle contraction. You'll learn about that later. All right? Fractures you get, especially something called green stick fat fractures, which we'll talk about when we get into fractures. So here's where you got knock knees going on here. And by the way, I'm not going to ask you to tell me these names over here. Don't worry about that. I just want you to understand what you would get with something if you have rickets. And why? You have knock knees over here or bowed legs over here. Okay? Now what happens if we remove the collagen? So that your bones become glass. That's called osteogenesis imperfecta. OI. So you get brittle bones due to a decrease in collagen in the bones. We sometimes call it brittle bone disease. It's a genetic disorder that makes defective or just no collagen. Now there's eight different types. You don't have to worry about just understand the concept of the disease when you have no minerals in there. I'm sorry, no collagen in there. Okay? Collagen is all over your body. It's not just in the bones. So other things are affected. And one thing that we classically see in people with osteogenic imperfecta is that their sclera, the whites in their eyes, are grayish in color. Because there's collagen that's in there too. Right, connective tissue that'll be in there. So that gets distorted and it creates this, this grayish color. That's why I look at people. I know what you have, I know what you have, I know. I just help and because I know all these things to look for. It's just not that I want to, it's just the way we're trained. And you will too when you get into a medical field. You just tend to look at people and say, I wouldn't go up to there and say, I know what you got. But I do do that. I mean, you know, um, I've had people come up with students. Actually, about three years ago, someone, came, one of her students came up and said, can you guess what I have? I said, you know, this is, you know, because not that I encourage that, but I'm, you know, they said, you know, want to challenge me, that's fine. Um, I, you know, I was looking, I said, I don't know, you know, but I looked at his eyes and they were like a grayish color. So I said, how many bones have you broken in your, in your, in your lifetime? He goes, ah, you know what I have. <laughs> Because I went right to the question, you know what I'm saying? Um, but yeah, they have a lot of fractures, loose joints, dental problems, poor muscle tone, hearing loss, we've got bones in here too that get affected, okay? Respiratory problems because the lungs don't develop properly. Again, collagen is found everywhere. There's a movie with Samuel Jackson yeah, um, and um, Bruce Willis, right? Yeah, Unbreakable. Unbreakable, yeah. And it was this guy that broke all his bones. He had osteogenic imperfecta. His gla he had glass bones. Yeah, Mr. Glass. Yeah, Mr. Gla yeah, something like that. He was a superhero. and It was actually a pretty good movie. I don't know why it didn't do so well. But um, watch it after this course is over. All right? <laughs> but anyway, that's what that is. And you see this. I don't know if you can see it with the lights, but you have this gray sclera there. Now, don't get me wrong. Some people are just born with grayness in the, in the sclera. I don't want people to say, oh, I know what you got. What do you mean? I haven't grayed in all my life. You know? So, um, but if they're breaking bones, if they have, let's say, you know, two fractures a year and they have this, uh, you know, I'm putting things together here. That's something to catch on early instead of catching on when you're 20 years old to see what you have. Right? So that's osteogenic imperfecta, and this kid has it too. If you actually... Not that you would. I don't think anyone here look, you know, I would say stalking him, but I mean, looked up Wikipedia and stuff. He has osteogenic imperfecta. You can see how many uh, fractures he's had in his lifetime. He's had numerous. Okay. I guess if you get really close up to his eyes, you'll see the the sclera is like grayish in color. Right. He's in that. What's that show? The uh, middle Malcolm in the Middle, something like that. Yeah. Or something like that. Right. All right. So anyway, that's osteogenic, uh, osteogenesis imperfecta, OI, okay? All right, now, bone growth regulation. It's stimulated by hormones, okay? We have growth hormone that comes from our pituitary gland. So we gotta make sure that the pituitary gland is functioning well, otherwise it's going to affect the growth. Sex hormones, testosterone and estrogen. As you know, in puberty, that's going to affect the growth spurt. 
Also thyroid hormones. If someone has something wrong with the thyroid at a young age, it's going to affect the growth. These are all hormones that are doing this. Now, calcium control. The body can't make its own calcium, so we always have to have a good supply of calcium coming in. But it's a lot stored in the bone. But we can't just use the bone and it goes away and it goes out your pee and whatnot, so you always got to replenish it. So this too is hormonally controlled. This a hormone called the parathyroid hormone. Don't get mixed up with the thyroid hormone. They're two totally different things. The only reason why it's called a parathyroid hormone is because the prefix para means next to. So these are little pea-like structures, glands, that are located next to the thyroid. They're called the parathyroid glands, and they secrete parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone, or PTH, gets released when calcium levels in the blood are low, then the parathyroid hormone is going to get released and target a few places. So this hormone is going to target the bone and say, Mr. Osteoclast, do your thing to get the calcium in the blood. So they increase osteoclast activity. They will also target the intestines to say, hey, look, you're eating a lot of food, and I know there's food in there that has calcium. Well, don't make any of it go out your poop. We need to absorb a, quite a bit more than what we usually need. It'll also target your kidneys. The kidneys are going to excrete excessive calcium, but the PTH is going to say, don't let that calcium escape the kidneys. Reabsorb it back into your bloodstream. So the PTH... Parathyroid hormone targets osteoclasts in the bone, intestines, and also the kidneys to put everything, try and get the calcium back into the bloodstream. Then we have calcitonin. Calcitonin is a hormone that comes from the thyroid gland. And when calcium levels are very high in the blood, calcitonin comes out of the thyroid and tells the bone to say, take that calcium in the blood and Mr. Osteoblast, put it back into the bone. So calcitonin is going to tone down calcium. Hey, there's a nice mnemonic, right? Parathyroid gland, a parathyroid hormone is going to increase calcium in the blood. Calcitonin is going to decrease calcium in the blood. Does that make sense? Okay. And like I just said, these are the target organs they go to. Bone, kidney, intestines, and these are the things that it does that I just explained to you. Okay? PTH does this in the bone, does this in the intestines, does this in the kidneys. This is the stuff I just explained, but there it is in words. Calcitonin goes to the same spots, but do the opposite effect. Skin. Skin is also important in terms of calcium regulation, specifically vitamin D. Vitamin D synthesis is going to, part of it's going to be needed in the synthesis process by the skin. Ultraviolet light from the sun is going to stimulate the skin to start making vitamin D. You only need about 45 minutes of sunlight each week for this to occur. I go to my doctor in February. He wants to do a vitamin D level on me. I say, don't do it. First off, it's $300. Secondly, I know it's low. I'm not wearing tank tops in February. Does that make sense? All right. So you expect it to be low. All right. So you just know in the winter months, you should be taking more calcium in the winter months. Not in Florida, but up here. You see what I mean? All right. So it makes sense. 
the vitamin D is needed to help absorb calcium in your diet. So it's going to target the intestines to make sure we can really absorb things from the calcium from our diet. The kidneys are going to also help uh, control calcium. They're going to make something called calcitriol. Calcitriol is basically, well, physiologically, it's the same thing as PTH. It works the same way. It's just not coming from the parathyroid uh, gland. But it works the same way. It's the most active form of vitamin D. It's also found in fortified milk. And it's activated by the kidney. The skin and liver, as I showed you, skin is needed for vitamin D synthesis also. So the skin, the liver, and the kidney are all working together to make this active form of vitamin D called calcitriol, which is going to help increase calcium into the bloodstream, just the way PTH would, parathyroid hormone would. Okay? If you have something called hypercalcemia, that's an increase of calcium in the bloodstream. And this is going to have side effects. You have too much calcium in the bloodstream, your kidneys are going to be overwhelmed with all this calcium, and it's going to get started getting clogged with calcium and forming calcium stones. So you're going to have kidney stones. You'll have brittle bones because the osteoclasts are working overtime. You'll have confusion. You're going to need calcium needed for one neuron going to another neuron. You'll have stomach ulcers and muscle weakness. So my little mnemonic on this is stones, bones, moans, and groans, right? Stones and bones, you know, groans is like, ah, moans like, ah, right? Hypocalcemia, a decrease of calcium in the blood, and that's going to affect uh, nerve transmission. You'll understand how calcium works when we get there, but you'll get tingling sensation, muscle spasms, and we'll get into those later. All right, so compact bone. You got the Habergian system we saw in histology. It's also known as an osteon. It's the functional unit of, of a uh, compact bone, those cylinders that we saw. And I'll show you pictures of that. The Habergian canal is in the center of each one of those Habergian systems. It's the bullseye, so to say. It's also known as a central canal. It's also known as an osteonic canal. They're the ones that go the length of the bone. But then we also have canals that make like H's. And I'll show you a picture of that, where they connect the Habergian canals. They're called Volkman canals. We have Havergian blood vessels in the Havergian canals. We got Volkman blood vessels in the Volkman canals. And then we got the lamellae, which are those concentric rings. The lacuna is where the osteocytes are. They were once osteoblasts that painted themselves into a lacuna, and now they're known as osteocytes. The canaliculi are those little rivers that come out of the lacuna that allow the nutrients to go from the osteo, I'm sorry, the osteonic uh, canals or the virgin canals of the blood vessels to carry the nutrients into each lacuna which has an osteocyte. So now you're looking at this, that little model I, model I showed you. There's a medullary cavity. You'll see the endosteum on the side there, but you'll see the spongy bone. This is one Habergian system, but they're all over here. Concentric rings are in there. This is similar to the model I showed you. Here's the Habergian blood vessels going through the Habergian canal, and then you got ones that go like an H. These are the Volkman canals that have the Volkman blood vessels that connect the Habergian blood vessels. Bone is very vascular, which is why it'll actually heal faster, much faster than cartilage. Six to eight weeks, usually. This is a close-up of the lacuna 
right? So this is a Habergian canal. Here's a lacuna, and you can see all those kind of liquid light coming out. Spongy or cancellous foam makes foam lighter, right? They're more like those loofahs I was telling you about. So it contains these, or consists of these chebeculae, which you've seen with the bone I just passed around. There's no blood vessels in here. The canaliculi connect to the open cavities rather than aversion canals do. That's how it gets its nutrients through these canaliculi in spongy bone. So spongy bone looks like this. If this is your skull, you've got two compact bones on either side sandwiching the spongy bone in there. And all those lines in there are what we call chebeculae. This is just a close-up of it. The spongy bone is in the ends of the bones. Now, looking at the trabeculae, it looks like it's haphazard, but it's not. They actually are in an organized fashion dealing with all the mechanical stresses that the body goes through. Where there's more pressure, more stress, then as they grow, because they keep on changing, like the way you put a plant on the, uh, on the windowsill, they will tend to lean towards the sunlight. Then you trick them and say, okay, you want to play games? I'm going to turn you around, you're going to face that way. Somehow it bends right towards the sunlight again, right? Same thing with here. The trabeculae, if there's going to be more pressure, it's going to create more, it's going to follow that, that sh those stress lines where there's more pressure to make it more sturdier. And this can change. It could realign itself and it could change. The way your femur is, your thigh bone, it's not straight in a, in a person. When you look at, let's say, in a skeleton here, they're going this way. So what's happening here is that the stress is not going to be perpendicular here with, with the bone itself. It's going to go perpendicular to the floor, not to the bone. So you can see it's not going this way, it kind of bends this way. Another way I could actually show you this is if you're a runner and you've been running for, let's say, I don't know, three years, you're jogging and you're doing your big, you know, you're training for the Olympics. You're putting more stress on your leg bones, are you not? Every time you land on your foot, bam, 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 bam. So the spongy bone is going to get more, it'll go towards where the stress is so you don't break your bones over there. Does that make sense? It just does that. Then you decide you want to take anatomy and physiology with me. You're not running as much. You're sitting down a lot more. So now the stress on your bones has been altered. Not much stress is on your legs. So the spongy bone is going to start changing, the trabeculae is going to start changing form to where the stresses are. Your butt bones will be actually a little bit more stronger because it's holding up your whole body. You see what I'm saying? So it changes. It doesn't change overnight. It changes a matter of you know weeks and months, and it adapts to that. So you have this bone remodeling. It's always replacing old bone with new bone because it's dealing with these, mecha these new mechanical stresses that your body's doing every day. Your bone is not the same it was five years ago. It's different. And it's doing this because it's doing all new sh uh, stresses. 5% of bone mass is remodeled each year on a normal basis. There are two types of people that, uh, these are two examples, that I, there's probably a lot more, but there's two examples that aren't going to do this. People who don't have the stresses on their bones. Bedridden people. They're just lying there in the bed. Their bones are not going to be strong. There's no stresses on it. Does that make sense? What about astronauts? They're up in space. There's no gravity up there. There's no stresses on the bone. They are at risk of getting osteoporosis. So while they're up there, if they're up there for a month, they have to, I'm just guessing, I'm, 
I, I know they have to do this, I just don't know how long, but they have to go maybe, I don't know, four hours a day into an area that has gravity. And they have to sit there and read a book or do whatever work they have to do so that their bones have some kind of pressure on them. So that when they come back to Earth, they don't, you know, even though they have a 30 year old body, but their bones are like, you know, 100 years old. And they have osteoporosis. Okay? So bones will always remodel itself due to these mechanical stresses that are put on them every day. Hint, hint, you do need to know that. Whenever I say hint, hint, there's going to be a question on the test. I can almost guarantee you that. Okay? So if the stress is unusual, they get deformed. For instance, let's say for some reason my legs get amputated. So now I start walking on my hands. Now my hands, since the way I'm walking, my bones are going to start growing in a weird way because it has to deal with new stresses. Does that make sense? So it starts growing in a different way. They start getting deformed. But it's to deal with the new stresses. Now my hands have to hold up my body, not like my legs anymore. So it starts doing that. Okay? 